Welcome back to the final episode of my investigation into the unsolved murder of Nicola Payne. As I continue my investigation, you will hear from witnesses for the first time, hear fascinating new evidence in the hope that I can jog someone's memory or that someone who has remained silent for decades and knows more will come forward to help solve this case and ultimately give Nicola back to her family. Hello, police emergency. Problem? It's a garden to dispose of Nick Payne. Okay, and what's the problem? I think I know who was doing it. You think you do? Yeah. Okay, and who's that? I'm investigating the unsolved murder of 18-year-old mum, Nicola Payne. She was last seen on the 14th of December 1991 when she vanished a short distance from her parents' home. She left behind her seven-month-old son. For 31 years, Nicola's family had been searching for answers. I have been given unprecedented access to police case files and have started to speak to key police officers and identify important new witnesses. I have begun to examine the alibis of two of the key suspects and focused on trying to identify key areas to search looking for Nicola. I know there are people in Coventry who know more, but can I get to them? DCI Martin Slevin's appointment in charge of the unsolved murder of Nicola Payne in 2012 completely changed the whole landscape of the investigation. His appointment gave Nicola's family hope. I began to, to painstakingly, pretty much in my own time, late evenings, late nights, with the help of my two family liaison officers, look for that one vital piece of information that might open this case up again. And, and eventually I found it. I found a pocket notebook entry of an officer that indicated there were witnesses who could break the alibi of Nigel Barwell and Thomas O'Reilly, but wouldn't give statements back in 1991-92. And the question I asked myself, has anybody been back to see these witnesses in that 20 years? And the answer was no, and that was my starting point. Nicola grew up in a community in Coventry, which is very tight-knit. And what I'm hoping to do is use the information I've been given by the police who are working very closely with me and visit some people who are either potential suspects or know those suspects. And my focus is to try and get those people to talk to me. And why would they talk to me now? Well, years later, people change their allegiances, they change their attitudes. Some of these people will become parents themselves and think, well, if my child goes missing, of course I'd want to know what happened to them. I've had some time to reflect on my investigation so far, and there was something that Malcolm Ross said to me from our previous encounter that I've taken a deeper look into. Is there any other cases that you looked at that were around this area that could have some similarities? Yes, there was, uh, there was a, a, a rape um, investigation um, sometime before uh, Nicky went missing. And of course we had to look at that to see if there's any similarities. Over the past few days I've dug further into this allegation and I can now reveal for the very first time that Barwell was arrested and charged with that alleged rape in 1986. A 31-year-old female had told police that she got out of a taxi after a night out with friends. She started walking the short distance to home. She became aware someone was on the opposite side of the road following her. She said she was approached by a male who made a walk to an area of wasteland on the opposite side of the road to the black pad, no more than 100 yards from where Nicola vanished. She claimed she was then raped twice over a period of two hours. She even said she was urinated on and threatened to be killed and put in the river sow. Barwell was a prime suspect, but the police could not find him. Then Barwell called the police and told them he was the man they are looking for and it was consensual sex. At court, Barwell admitted to having sexual intercourse with the woman, but stated it was fully consensual. The jury believed him and Barwell was acquitted. Now I want to go back and have a look at the area where witnesses say a Ford Capri was seen on the Saturday. And when I get there, 
I meet a man who says his wife saw the Capri and tells me something which could be very significant. Presumably you know the Black Pad area. Yes, there. yes. Of, um, of. And what I found incredible is that, so Nicholas seemed to get to the entranceway to the Black Pad, and I've just timed it, and you know, it's from that entranceway there, it's four minutes to where her parents' house is. Mm -hmm. That's a tiny window of opportunity. Yes. And nobody sees her walking mm -hmm. across that Black Pad. It was probably the conditions because it was so foggy. Right. It was really, really bad. And on that Saturday, at some stage, you're not entirely clear, your wife saw a Capri mm -hmm. parked at the end of this lane. Yes. And these gates weren't here. So if you wanted to drive, for example, from the area over there uh -huh. to here, could you do that? Yes, yes. There was free access to this, to this field. Right. 24 7. Right. Okay. So I've seen uh, photographs of the day, and there are tyre tracks which look to show a vehicle having driven from the area where Nicola was last sighted just before we get on the black pad to this area. Would that be consistent with a, a, an opportunity for a car to drive across that way? Absolutely, yes. It would have been quite clear for a vehicle to come that way without any, any problems. And did the cars used to do that? Yes. Two really important sightings of a Capri here. And that's why I wanted to come and look at this area. I turn up and a man comes and says, do you want to go down the pathway? I live at this house just over the back here. And actually when I get talking to him, his wife sees on the day a Capri parked here on that Saturday. It's a new witness. 26 years on, he says, yeah, the police did talk to my wife on that day. They said they were gonna come back and they never did. But I think what it tells you is even 26 years on, a crucial witness who's never ever been in the police system, we've just found. Louise Sandbrook previously refused to give a statement, but was revisited in 2012 by police and this time gave a formal account. She states, she saw Barwell and O'Reilly stood by Barwell's Capri on the day Nicola vanished, at a location about five minutes drive away from the Black Pad, on the day that both Barwell and O'Reilly told the police they were in rugby. I meet in Martin Slevin at the location of that sighting. Thanks for coming to meet me, Martin. It's good to see you again, Mark. So, Martin, this is a really significant location in terms of one of the witnesses. What I'd like you to do is talk me through what they told you they saw on that Saturday afternoon. Yeah, we're in Dunrose Close in Coventry, Mark, and it, this was a, a key significant event. We had a witness, uh, Louise Sandbrooks, who lived at the house over there. And what Miss Sandbrooks uh, told us when officers uh, called her address was that late on the Saturday afternoon, sometime around 3 o'clock, 3.30, she saw a metallic uh, blue Ford Capri just parked in this position here, uh, reversed in. Um, and she actually knew the, the owner of that vehicle was Nigel Barwell. And she told us that she saw Mr. Barwell and uh, Thomas O'Reilly, his brother-in-law, uh, here with the vehicle, with the boot open. And subsequently she told us that she could see an object hanging from the rear of the vehicle. Um, what she then told us was that um, Nigel Barwell noticed that she was looking from bedroom window uh, and she ducked down out of the way, didn't want to be seen. And a few minutes later, when she, she looked out again, the vehicle had disappeared. So the witness, Louise Sambra, is in no doubt that the two people she saw was Nigel Barwell and Thomas O'Reilly. Absolutely, she knew both of those, uh, those individuals. In fact, they called at her address on the Friday evening in order to speak to her partner. And so that was a significant sighting. It placed them in Coventry at a time when they said they weren't here. And it was also significant as subsequently we found a tent uh, on this land, which became a key uh, aspect of this investigation. So I think what I'd like to, Mark, is take you uh, along the path here and show you the location uh, roughly where the tent was found, which became a significant item in this investigation. So the tent was found somewhere just in this area here. Uh, this area hasn't changed uh, at all, really, since 1991. So tell me, what was found and why is it significant? 
Well, we found two items, uh, a Freeman, uh, it was described as a Freeman Bell tent. It's in fact a small two-man tent. And what was described as an awning. In fact, when we did further inquiries, it was the canvas outer of a small frame tent. Uh, they, were, they were dry, they weren't dirty. They'd clearly only been placed there recently. It wasn't until Barwell's vehicle was searched by the Forensic Science Service uh, and in mid-January we were notified that in the glove box of that car was the manual that matched that Freeman tent. I'm aware that another young woman from Coventry, Barbara Finn, vanished a few months before Nicola's disappearance. I've carefully read the case file and they do have some striking similarities. Could they be connected? Barbara was, was a sex worker um, that operated in the Hillfields area of Coventry, the red light district, and she went missing about six weeks before Nicola. But she went out onto, onto a patch um, in, in the evening. She left her, her daughter with her sister nearby, in a house nearby. She came back around nine or 10 o'clock to check everything was okay and then went back out onto her patch. And, and um, habitually she would, she would finish at about midnight and come home and she, she never came home. I reviewed both of those in terms of common people within them, any um, vehicles that may have been common to both inquiries. There were two or three people common to each of them, um, but we explored those, we interviewed them and their explanations as to why and the reasons why they were, they were in each inquiry were perfectly legitimate, so I had no concerns about that. During the early days of my investigation, I reached out to Nicola's son, Owen. He was seven months old at the time she disappeared. I've just heard that he's agreed to give me an interview for the very first time, so I'm on my way to meet him. Owen, you've never spoken to anybody in the media before. You've never given an interview, but you've agreed to speak to me. Why? It's just, uh, just for me, Nan. I'm a granddad, really. As I get older, I can see it's, obviously it's always been tough, but I can just see it's getting a lot tougher the older they get. And we've agreed to protect your identity. Why is that? Just, I just don't want to be, don't want to be treated any different. I don't want people to feel sorry for me. You were seven when your mum went. That means I'm assuming you have no actual memories yourself. No. Yeah, like you say, I was seven months I was. Yeah. So yeah, I can't remember a thing. No, just from pictures and stuff. Yeah. That's about it. Would you say you've ever really just sat down and? and talked about it and talked through what your thoughts are about it? Or? No, no, it's never been, it's not, never been for me, that sort of thing. People have said about therapy and stuff like that, but it's, no, it's just not for me, though. So you cope with it by putting yeah. it to the back of your mind? Yeah, it's like everything, to be fair, any sort of situation, it's just how I'll deal with things, yeah. i just put things to the back and just try and carry on. And do you get times when it does trouble you, it does worry you? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. It's, uh, there's only so much you can just try and sort of ignore things and that, and yeah, of course things build up on you. So, given the fact you haven't really spoken about it to anybody, are there questions and things in your head that you really think, you know, I'd love to know the answer to that? No, just, just a big one, I suppose, like what happened and where is she? It's just, it's not so much for myself. It might sound a bit stupid saying that because it's my mum, but it's not so much for myself. It's for what I've seen it do to my nan and my granddad over the years. That's, that's all they all want the answers for, it's for them too. Do you think there's still people out there who who know more and aren't talking? Well yeah, someone must know something. But I suppose in a way, if someone knows something and it weren't anything to do with them but they know the situation was bad or whatever, I can understand why some people want to protect themselves and their family from certain situations. So in a way I do get it, but in a way, they need to find a bit of courage and come forward for, like I say, not for myself, but for my nan and for my granddad. It is very sad and emotional speaking with Owen. I can't for one minute begin to imagine what it must be like for him growing up knowing your mum was murdered and her killer or killers are still at large and most likely still living in the community. I know he wants answers for his grandparents, but actually we owe him answers and justice too. I'm now on my way to see another witness who was initially spoken to in 1991, but was too scared to give a statement. She was seen again in 2013 by police, and this time she gave a statement. So I'll get straight to the point. The reason for coming to see you is that on 
the Saturday 14th of December 1991, you saw something outside Barwell's house. Tell me what you saw. Um, I seen Nigel, he was cleaning the car, he took the baby seat out the back, put it on the road, uh, just gave it a wipe down and just generally cleaned it. And um, then later on he got in the car with his brother-in-law and I never seen him again that day. So do you see that car again on the Saturday afternoon or evening? No. It was about 11 o'clock um, when I seen it. So just to be entirely clear, on that Saturday morning, you can say with certainty that the Ford Capri was on that driveway and you saw the owner of that Ford Capri cleaning it and taking a car seat out. Yes, yes. Joy's evidence contradicts what Barwell and O'Reilly told the police that they were in rugby all day on the Saturday when Nicola vanished. Joy positively identifies both of them being in Coventry on the Saturday. And what did you see on the Sunday, so the following day? Um, he again had the car, he cut everything out, he cleaned the boot inside the car, um, and not just a little wipe, he got the vac out and, and everything. It would have been about 10, 11, definitely before lunch, 10 or 11, yeah. How would you describe the way that he cleaned that car? Really thoroughly, I mean, um, he never used to take the stuff out, his wife never used to take the stuff out, never seen him with vacuum cleaning it, and um, everything was just right, even the boot, inside the boot, and the car wheels, everything. So do you see anything else that weekend that I've noticed that you remember now? He had a caravan. Um, which was part of the other, the back of the, the garages. You also cleaned that out. Um, so you actually saw him cleaning the caravan? I seen him. We, we, the, my kids used to play on the field and you had to go down the entryway to get to the field. And I was playing football with my, my girls and everything. And when we come back, I'd seen him cleaning the caravan out. So when did that caravan, when did you notice that caravan had gone? I think a couple of weeks after that, he, he, it had gone. What a great witness. I mean, no doubt in terms of what she was telling us. She was totally clear. and memory, you can tell, can't you? And she's definite that it was that weekend as well. But what stands out for me, is, I've not heard it before, is this cleaning of the caravan. Yeah. Have you heard that? No. So not only was he cleaning his Capri, but on the same day, he thoroughly cleaned out his caravan. That is important. So what exactly was the account given by Barwell and O'Reilly? So Nigel Barwell uh, and Thomas O'Reilly have a very similar account that they gave to police late on, on Sunday the 15th of December when they were brought in to, to essentially help with inquiries. And that was this, that there was a pre-arranged meeting with Colin Jones in rugby. They, they'd been over to rugby a month or two before. We had a letter to show that that was an arrangement that was made for the November, but there was no letter to show that that arrangement had been made for the December. In fact, Colin Jones was actually babysitting um, at, at a family address on that occasion, so there was no, there was no pre-arranged meeting. But Barr and O'Reilly um, stated that they went to rugby on the Friday evening, they failed to meet Jones, and they went and had alcohol and smoked cannabis, and that they went back to their car and uh, it wouldn't start, so they claimed to have slept in the car it was one of the coldest nights of the year and they claimed to have woken up uh, around midday on the Saturday. Now this was a very busy Saturday in a very small car park in Rugby Town Centre which was incredibly busy because of Christmas shopping. And they claimed that they stayed there all day without buying a car park ticket and eventually they managed to get the car going in the early hours of the Sunday morning and that they'd then driven back to Coventry uh, and both uh, gone back to their respective addresses. I've read thousands of documents contained within the police files and some additional witnesses stand out for me. Debbie Lawrence was friends with Nigel Barwell's wife Mary. Debbie says that on a Tuesday at the beginning of December 1991 Mary came to see her and they were due to go for a meal. She says that Mary told her that Nigel had become angry about the cost of that meal and she says it was okay for him to go out on Friday overnight to rugby with Tom, but she couldn't go for a meal. Debbie then goes on to say that on Saturday, the 14th of December, around 10am, she saw Nigel Barwell's Capri parked in the usual place outside, 
she thought to herself, he is back from Coventry. When she returned an hour later, the Capri had gone. Another witness who came forward with information apparently implicating Barwell was Paul Southern. He was a potential witness in 1991, but only spoke in detail in 2012. I have tried to talk to him, but he's refused to go on camera, so I've asked Martin Slevin to give me the details of his account. So Paul Southern told us that uh, on a date in January, not long after Nicola had gone missing, so January 1992 now, uh, he was asked by um, uh, Barwell and O'Reilly and a friend Colin Jones uh, to drive them to Coventry to Barwell's home address. And he didn't want to, but reluctantly did. And when they got there, they parked near to uh, Nigel Barwell's house in Venter Close, near enough so they could hear the conversation going on inside the, the open doorway of the house. Barwell and O'Reilly went inside and Nigel Barwell's wife essentially accused him uh, of carrying on with a girl from Wood End and said words to the effect of I know you did that girl from Wood End. When they all got back in the car there was Paul Southern, Colin Jones, Thomas O'Reilly and Nigel Barwell and it was stony silence and Paul Southern broke that silence by saying to Barwell well come on who's this girl you've been doing from Wood End? Nigel Barwell's response was, I haven't been doing a girl from Wood End, I killed Nicola Payne. Yeah. And he looked at Colin Jones, Colin Jones nodded in the affirmative. Thomas O'Reilly chipped in, uh, you don't know the half of it. Martin and his team spent hours thoroughly reviewing all of the case files to identify new evidence. The, the big breakthrough came um, actually um, when we, uh, Louise Sandbrook's um, statement was analysed, what Louise Sandbrook's was telling us was that, you know, this, this object she saw at the back of Bowles um, for Capri that was hanging out was wrapped in something uh, black or dark and shiny. And I thought well, that might be a starting point. And of course, I sent that off to the laboratory and we recovered upwards of 30 to 40 hairs from that tent and one hair in particular stood out in that we were able to match that hair to Nicola with a probability of 1 to 900 million. Just to be clear, in that tent you find a hair, you do a DNA analysis on that and the result is that that hair is 900 million to 1 to belong to Nicola. Yes, absolutely. And not only that, there was trace on that hair of strands that matched Nigel Barwell as well. Our family are pleased to hear yesterday the news that two people have been charged with the murder of our beloved daughter Nicola. We would like to thank everyone for their kind support over the years. Although this is a significant step, our ultimate aim has always been to find Nicola in order to bring some peace to our family. In October 2015, both Barwell and O'Reilly went on trial at Birmingham Crown Court. From the outset, they maintain their innocence, denying any involvement in Nicola's disappearance or murder. We felt that we had a very strong case. We always knew that we were going to face an argument of cross-contamination with the tent um, because of the loss of audit trail of the tent. So we were able to show the continuity of that tent and whether there was any probability there could have been cross-contamination with any of the um, samples that were taken at the time from Bowen and O'Reilly, and that was a difficult uh, issue. The tent and the hair fibres played an important part of the police case, but the storing of the exhibits was very heavily criticised as sloppy and frankly inadequate. A review in 2012 found that 97 exhibits had either gone missing or had been destroyed, including initial witness statements. During the trial, Bauer described the case against him as absolutely absurd and denied deliberately delaying his attendance at an identification parade held in 1991 and 92. When asked if he was involved in Nicholas' disappearance, he said, Absolutely not. Me and Thomas are completely innocent of these charges. We would never harm a young lady. It never happened. Full stop. During O'Reilly's evidence, he broke down in a witness box and said that in 1992, when questioned, a well-built police officer had threatened to do him in. 
After a five-week trial, the jury retired to consider a verdict. And after eight hours of deliberation, over three days, the jury returned a not guilty verdict. Barwell and O'Reilly walked free from court. It's a message on behalf of my mum and dad. Um, our family are devastated and heavy-hearted with today's verdict. For nearly 24 years, we have lived daily in the anguish of not knowing what's happened to our beloved Nicola. And worse than that, to this day, not even knowing where she is. I just sat there and when they asked for their verdict, I just, eyes closed. And when they said not guilty, I just couldn't. Good answer. I just sat there. Hmm. But Marilyn wasn't in court, she was in another room upstairs. I said, gotta get to her, gotta get to her. And we just sat there looking at each other. Till the police come in and they apologised. I said, well, I just didn't know how to answer them at the time, at, you know. Do you feel angry? I do know how I feel about the way the case went. We just didn't know what to, what to do. As a result of the publicity of the trial, a new witness comes forward, Barry. Not his real name, he's agreed to meet me at the location where he believes he saw something of significance. This is exclusive. New evidence never revealed publicly before. Thank you so much for meeting me. Hello, Mark. A cold day. It is. So this is Coombe Fisheries Car Park. Yep. Talk me through and walk me through where you go. Um, basically, I've headed in, into that corner direction. Yep. Um, there's a bank here, which was shielded from the actual wood. So I've walked kind of into that diagonal direction. Right over the stream, onto the bank. So let's walk that way. Okay. So here is the pathway. Yep. So what were you coming here for on that Saturday? Um, basically, I was having a look at it to possibly do some fishing the following day. Right. Um, so I came up to have a look basically at the lake and to see if there was anybody up here who could tell me if it was a season ticket or a day ticket, how you actually go about fishing it. And you know it was that Saturday that Nicola went missing because of what? I knew it was 1991. And then later when I saw that Nicola had gone missing and they appealed for anyone that saw anything strange i could even remember thinking i saw something strange on that day but it was nowhere near there so you basically realized something was strange around the time but because of coombe park not being right by the black pad you didn't think they were connected i just didn't see a connection at the time so let me take you back to that saturday afternoon as much as you can you are walking along this path. Yeah. Talk me through what you're doing. So, what are we up? We're up to post number six. Yeah. The path is beginning to curl round. Talk me through what you're doing and what you hear or see. You just couldn't see the water at all. It was just. You couldn't see the water. No, it was just fog sat on the water. Okay. Um, initially, it sounded like someone was shouting, or a man was shouting at someone else. Right. And when I turned, there was two males going along that way, probably about three to five feet apart at an angle. Can you describe what they're doing in any way? Um, well, the impression I got was the fellow that I saw bad his hands out, kind of like that. Yeah. Like the way I saw it at the time, it was like he was sneaking up on something. Okay. Um, but there was two moving that way. And are they saying anything? Are they talking? Uh, initially, I could hear 
it sounded like one was shouting at the other one. Right. Um, but what they were saying, I don't know. And were they carrying anything? Did they have anything with them? It, it was foggy and it was a lot kind of denser then. So I've basically got a quick kind of look at them. Right. And I've basically concentrated on the one who had his, just had his, his hands, hands out like that. that. I went back to Barry's house to hear the rest of his account. Went back towards my car after a short period. Uh, there was a man stood next to the passenger side of the car. Out the corner of my eye, as I walked past him, there was a man coming out of the wooded area. He come down from the wooded area in between me and my car, and the first thing he said was, how long have you been here? I replied, around 20 minutes, at which point he said, doing what? I said, looking around the lake, and he replied, what, in the middle of winter? I replied, yes. He then implied that I'd been watching what they were doing in the woods, which I didn't. Um, he then carried on asking me several things along the same lines, and at that one point turned to his friend and said, help me. His friend just replied, let's just go. We then got near my car, and he's walked past my car, towards the gate, I've got in my car, started it, and as I drove out the gate, he was fumbling with the chain, basically trying to shut the gate. I drove past him to the end of the drive, and as I gave away, at the end of the drive, he's ran up the drive. I then drove away. It was the court case that caused Barry to come forward. He can't be certain that the two men he saw on the Saturday were Barwell and O'Reilly but he does think it is significant. As a direct result of this new information, I have called in my friend and search expert, Peter Fordy, to examine this new identified area at Coombe Abbey. Peter and his team are the country's leading authority in the search for human bodies and remains and are regularly deployed by the police. The purpose of today's search is we are looking for Nicola Payne. Nicola Payne was aged 18 when she went missing December 1991. We have a vast array of equipment available to us this week for the search. Side scan sonar, magnetometry, ground penetrating radar. And what I want to point out particularly is the clothing that we know Nicola was wearing when she went missing and that is the brown jacket, the brown trousers, the purple shirt and importantly two items of jewellery and the brown shoes. In addition, there may well be a pink blanket and possibly a ground sheet from a tent. So as Mark said, we're going to be searching this area of woodland and the lake. Sonar team, Stuart, you're with me, and Steve, you're taking the helm. Tony, Barney, you run the dive team, and they've got the divers ready to go. Today I'm the dive supervisor and I've got a diver in the water and he's in nil visibility. So not only is the water brown and the visibility is reduced to probably six inches, once he's actually searching through the silt, which is in places 12 inches to armpit depth, it's black and it's churned up. His visibility is absolutely zero. So at that stage, the diver will be diving most likely with his eyes closed so he can concentrate on touch. In the meantime, I've found a new witness named Martin Strong in the police case files who I want to visit. Strong initially spoke to the police in 9192, giving both Barwell and O'Reilly an alibi that they were in rugby on Saturday the 14th of December. But when re-interviewed in 2012, he retracted his statement and claimed both suspects were actually in Coventry and had never gone to rugby that day. In fact, he says that Barwell had been at the cook's house on the morning that Nicola disappeared. He told Strong, if anyone asks, I have been in rugby all weekend. Having tracked down his address, I'm on my way to see if he'll speak to me. So I've just knocked on the door of a potentially important witness and sadly he died a couple of years ago. Um, so that is frustrating. It's frustrating because I think he had something that was really important in terms of uh, he'd been asked by our potential suspects to provide an alibi. I've got his statement, but I wanted to talk to him you know, face to face. And it may well be that he had additional information, which he hasn't yet shared. So 
Disappointing, but there's plenty more to go and see. With every search comes renewed hope for Maz and John, but it is vital we temper this because finding Nicola's body that has remained hidden for well over 20 years is going to be very difficult. So Pete, this is interesting, isn't it? What have we got? Well, my cat colleague was searching the, uh, the, the, this end of the wood. The car park is literally there where the suspects were last seen. So he, he's, he's looking around and he's found a pile of sort of shoes. This particular one, brown leather. Now, the last thing Nicola was seen was wearing a pair of brown leather boots. Here somewhere there's a sole. I don't want to move too much. And it's quite went... a strange collection. So you've got a collection of shoes, yeah. but then you've got pink nail varnish. Yeah, that's right. Roll-on deodorant, or I don't know, something it like looks that. Like a, roll -on. Looks a roll -on. That looks like a roll-on. And um, look, this is clearly a hairbrush, the yeah, base of a right. hairbrush. And a toothbrush over there as well. well this, this looks like a, a lady's stocking here, or a pair of tights. But this is clearly years old. Yeah, I mean, I'm more steered towards someone having pulled them together, yeah. cleared up. Yeah, just someone just tied it up and then chucked it all there. Let's fine. properly plot it and everything and yeah, then... Yeah, absolutely. We've got I that. I think it's good, fine, well done. Yeah, I mean, well it's, done. listen, it's, it, it shouldn't be here. Yeah. And it's got yeah. items which, you know, we're looking for a murder victim yeah. who's a female. Yeah. We've got female shoes, yeah. hairbrush, yeah. deodorant. Yeah, small, small toothbrush Nail brush varnish. Well. Oh, this yeah. is old. Years. This is old. That leather, leather doesn't degrade that. Thing. No. No. And a stocking. I wonder if she was wearing a stocking. My presence in Coventry is attracting considerable media attention. And as a result, I've been contacted by a woman who believes she has information about the whereabouts of Nicola. So a very strange night. We met this woman who basically says that she knows where Nicola Payne is and she came and met us here and her explanation is is simply that she has a piece of technology it's so top secret and it can find dead people who could this person be could they have been put up to it could they be part of something else um, and we came back to the bottom line is there was only one way to find out and that is to go to the location that she's suggesting that nicola is in and find recover her so we've been given a piece of information that Nicola Payne's body is dumped in this pond. I have to say, the evidence I've been given doesn't stack up. It's pie in the sky stuff. But what we can't do is ignore it. We've been here now for four hours and the team has thoroughly searched this small pond. And as I thought, Nicola is not in the water. Yet another pointless search and draining resources and time. It's now day four into our search of Coombe Abbey for Nicola and last night Rebecca received a call from someone who says they have new information. I'm on my way to see them now. Hi there Matthew. Hello Mark. Thank you so much for agreeing to see me. Can I come in? Yeah, come in. Brilliant. It's right if I sit down. Yeah, take a seat, please. Brilliant. For the last few days, I've been sleeping very well. You know, I'd like to tell you what happened in 1991 with Barwell um, Bar and O'Reilly and Colin when, when we were sitting in the pub talking and um, Barwell mentioned something about the canal at Harbour Magna. He was saying that they didn't mean to kill Nicola Payne. It was an accident, but um, nobody would believe them because it was either they were known to the police in that area or they were known to people in that area. But, uh, and then he was talking something about um, over a canal bridge at um, Harbour Magna. And I got the impression that they dumped Nicola Payne's body in the canal from the bridge at Harbour Magna. I mean, this is really significant. And this now gives me the opportunity to go and look at that area and potentially see if it's somewhere we can search to find Nicola. But what your memory has come back as it could be could be the final solution to finding Nicola's body. This could be vital information, but I'm very conscious that Malcolm says that he remembered this over 30 years after Nicola disappeared, and long after Barwell and O'Reilly were acquitted of Nicola's murder by a Crown Court jury. But in the search to find Nicola, 
I need to speak to the police and see if this area has been searched. And if not, then we will need to do it to see if Nicola's body is there. I just find it incredible that this guy comes forward, you know, now, I know, it's but with a memory that he couldn't remember things and then suddenly something gets placed in his mind and he remembers events. It's a great place to get rid of a body. I mean, bodies do get dumped in water yeah. and you don't find them for ages. And you think at that time of year it would have been easier to dispose of it in water mm. than underground. So if you're thinking about it, so if you turn up in your car, you can either chuck over the edge yeah. or, or carry down. But would you throw it over the edge? There's too much risk. And what if the body floated? You'd need to know, yeah, wouldn't you? Would. you would. Plus, you don't know if you're chucking the body out. I mean, you've got, well, you've got to lift it, but if you're going to chuck the body into the water, you are then going to have to get in the water, aren't you? Yeah. So, looking here now, you think, OK, it was a foggy day, so maybe you couldn't see that far, but you'd still have a good line of sight to the right and to the left, wouldn't you? Yeah. It's perfect, isn't it? If you, if you want to do something out of sight... So how far away now are we from Coventry and Rugby? Well, Coventry is about eight and a half miles that way and then rugby is about three miles this way nice. so you can imagine this is in between and don't forget on that day there was a frost in the ground yeah. so it was quite hard you could get the top surface off but digging deep would have been really difficult so mm. how does you get rid of a body really quickly yeah. without digging well one option is in the water peter fording will now liaise with west midland police detectives and use his team to search the large identified area which is going to be a massive job. We're here acting on information received about a possible location for Nicola Payne. Nicola Payne went missing in 1991 and we haven't given up our search for her. So Sam, what is your role in West Midlands Police? So my current role is the head of the Homicide Department for West Midlands Police. And today it starts an operation in terms of looking for, in simple terms, Nicola Payne's body. What is the plan? So as we know, Nicola Payne has been missing 29 years now and acting on new information received in the last couple of weeks, we are going to search the canal area with specialist teams, Peter Folding and his team, um, to hopefully find Nicola for her family. So Sam, this is quite an important piece of information that you're acting upon now. Yes, so the information has come to light in the last couple of weeks and clearly, um, looking at other investigative opportunities that we've had in the past, linking it up to all the information we know, um, we consider it of importance such that we are deploying the search teams to look into this information. So yes, it could be a breakthrough and we all hope for Nicola's family that it absolutely is. And you've never searched this area before, have you? No, this hasn't featured on any of our previous searches. We have searched a number of locations previously, including areas of water, but not this area. And just talk me through, so you have a specialist individual called a pulser, so they're involved in looking at the scene and assessing how that fits it potentially within the information that you know and and the crime. How does that work? So we have specially search advisors um, called our Pulsar search teams and the information about where searches have taken place previously, how successful they've been um, and as a result they develop a knowledge base and experience base of where to search um, and the Pulsar helps us in understanding whether this would be a viable option to search and with the other information in the investigation that's why we have started today to look at search in this area. And the Pulsar's view is that this is a credible place to be searching? Absolutely. I've been called down to look at something the divers have found. Me? It's a plastic bag, isn't it? All around this oh. Is that a bin liner? Yeah. yeah. I don't know whether it's mud in there or whether it's... I'll get a diver. How are you going to get over there? Down through the brambles, probably. The diver has also found a sledgehammer. Uh, Lovely. So, Pete, nothing in that bag at all? Bag of mud? Yeah, it's full of mud, isn't it? So what we've done now, we've um, done a num number of bridges. This is um, the last one we're doing today. But we've extended the search on this one to 30 metres either side, so we can ensure we've eliminated it completely out of the search. Unfortunately, nothing has been found here. Um, and then tomorrow we're going to move on to the next bridge, which will be our final bridge, to do a thorough search of that one as well. As the week draws to an end, so does the search. And we've so far not found Nicola or anything relevant to her murder. So I am deflated, deflated because I am convinced that she is in this canal. All our information, all our intelligence, you look at all of the 
background back to 91 and it would tell you that she hasn't been buried in the ground. We've got permafrost, it's a really cold day. I am convinced that she is in the water. She is in this canal. The problem is, where? I have one last thing I want to do before I go and update the family and that is go and speak to Barwell and O'Reilly. Hello, Mr O'Reilly. Mark Williams Thomas. I'm doing a reinvestigation into the murder of Nicola Payne. No, 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 hang on, just hear me, just hear me. All I want to know, all I want to know is where Nicola's buried, all right? I don't know where she is and I don't know anything about it. All right. I'm just giving you a lifeline. All I want to do is find Nicola, all right? I haven't got a clue where she is. I don't know anything about anything. Okay. OK, well, you've got my details, all right? O'Reilly is insisting he's got nothing to do with the disappearance of Nicola. So now let's go and see what Barwell has to say. So plan is to doorstep Nigel Barwell. He's just round the corner. He's in a shop at the moment. So we're going to wait for him to come out of the shop. And then once he's come out of the shop, we're then going to speak to him on the street. Nigel Barwell, Mark Williams Thomas, you obviously know who I am. Nigel, I want to talk to you about the disappearance of Nicola Payne. You claim to be in rugby, but you know that's not true, don't you? Nigel, just talk to me, come on. You haven't talked, you've never given an interview. This is your opportunity to say what you want to say. So what were you doing on that Saturday? Because I've got information, witnesses who knew you, who know you and knew you at the time, and they said that you were actually in Coventry. You weren't in rugby. They also know that you were at the cook's house on that morning. Don't shut the door on me. Come on, talk to me. Nigel, talk to me, come on. Come on, talk to me. Nigel, talk to me, come on. Come on, let's talk to me. Come on, talk to me. You're not going to talk to me? Well, that was a real shame. I gave Nigel Barwell the opportunity. There's a lot of evidence against him in relation to the disappearance of Nicola Payne. I just wanted him to tell me that on that Saturday, he was, as he claims to be, in rugby with his Capri on that morning. That's a real shame. He had an opportunity to deny it all. Didn't want to talk to me. I just want that one answer. Where is she? So they can find her and bring her back home. Is that the most important thing? That's all I'm interested in. I'm not interested in prosecution no more, murder cases. I just want to find her to bring her back home. So they know where she is. I've been handed an audio recording by a member of the Payne family of an emergency line 999 call. This call has never been heard before. I'm about to reveal an exclusive recording of Barwell calling the police. It is some very interesting information about the unsolved murder of Barbara Finn. This, this is Barney. Do you want to find uh, Barbara Finn? Right, okay. For example, there's a lot more to be found, okay? Just for example, do you want to find Barbara Finn? Yeah, yeah listen. Yeah, listen. Sadly, since this programme was filmed and recorded, Maz has passed away. Special thanks to the family of Nicola Payne, West Midlands Police, Peter Falling Specialist Group International, and editors Martin Kayes, Jodie Doherty Cove, Jamil Meyer and Blackboard Productions.